Hello again, astronauts. If you're new here, welcome. I make wacky science videos. If you enjoy this video, please subscribe and check out our Patreon for behind the scenes, early access, production updates, and to help us keep bringing you better and sillier content. Pluto patron Jed Indiana Jones suggested that I do some more sci-fi reviews, and it's no secret that I am a huge Trekkie. And you can thank Star Trek Voyager for bringing me into the franchise. Oh hi Astra, I also love Voyager. To everyone else, hey y'all, I'm the creator of Strings, a sci-com channel centering on biology and biochemistry, as well as the intersection between science and society. It's still a fairly new channel and just getting off the ground, so feel free to hit it up. Hi Strings, thanks for joining me to chat about the science of Star Trek. Voyager as a show was important to us both because of its amazing characters. Kate Mulgrew's portrayal of the captain who could command respect, be proudly feminine, and was always a scientist first was a role model I idolized. Belana Torres, a brilliant engineer with strong and outspoken ideals who constantly questioned authority and desperately sought a space with like-minded people, was someone I could relate to. And watching her grow and let her guard down made me feel hopeful. While I'd like to emulate the quiet confidence of Chakotay, or perhaps Tom Paris's charm, Do you always fly at women at warp speed, Mr. Paris? I feel like the character I identified the most with is the Doctor. I can totally relate to his dry sarcasm as well as his hidden earnestness. And his growth over the seasons as an independent sapient being, you know, discovering what it is to be human, was one of the best character arcs in the show. And of course, there was Seven of Nine, the one who knew everything she could download in writing, yet struggled to get along with the crew and navigate social situations, which was very relatable to the middle school me who excelled in academics and struggled to make friends. The relatability was helped by the fact that I was too young to pick up on the objectifying costume and camera angles. I had no idea. <clears throat> My prepubescent brain didn't notice any of that. <laughs> and I see the way your pupils dilate when you look at my body. I don't know what you're talking about. So let's talk about Scorpion, the season-splitting two-part episode which introduced one of the most iconic characters in all of Star Trek. And, like Captain Janeway, let's be scientists first. Specifically, let's talk about pressure and spaceship hull mechanics. Borg space. The most formidable villain of Next Gen has its base in the Delta Quadrant, so diehard Trek fans likely suspected this showdown was coming. Voyager encounters not one, but a fleet of Borg cubes, and prepares for a final futile resistance, but ends up being scanned and ignored as the cubes flee a greater threat. So what could have the Borg running scared? Meet Species 8472. Aliens will only ever know by their Borg designation. They're from a different dimension, completely resistant to assimilation, and merciless. They outgun and outmatch the Borg at every turn. But, more importantly, their home, fluidic space, isn't a near vacuum, but a dense medium. And, spoilers, Voyager enters fluidic space for a few minutes of screen time. This ship was built in space dock for travel in space and planetary atmospheres. Could it survive in a medium, or would it be crushed? First of all, fluid does not necessarily mean liquid. Air is also technically a fluid, and technically, flying through a gas giant like Jupiter would be flying through a fluid. However, the special effects and sounds lead the viewer to believe that fluidic space is as dense as a liquid. It's also organic, which is interesting because that means the entire space is either alive or used to be. So 
We're gonna ignore the organic bit since that doesn't affect physics. Will that be my job? You're the squishy physicist. It's biologists. Biology, the study of old life. That's what I said, squishy physics. Another important note I'll make is that fluidic space as a concept doesn't make much sense. Clearly, the physics of this parallel dimension works similarly to our home space dimension, since nothing catastrophic happens immediately when Voyager enters as physics breaks. However, if gravity works the same way as it does in our dimension, where matter is attracted to other matter by gravity, fluidic space should collapse in on itself, forming a sphere, a giant universe-sized Jupiter, which is increasingly dense closer to the center. If fluidic space is spherical, and Voyager entered far enough away from any edges that it wouldn't detect them, yeah, that ship would be crushed instantly. A spaceship designed to keep an atmosphere or two of pressure inside from getting out and be capable of landing on planets with even up to two or three times Earth's atmosphere's worth of pressure shouldn't be over-designed to the point where it can go underwater. Even in the Federation, with replicators and a socialist utopia, that would be a massive waste of resources. So Voyager and the Enterprise can't go swimming. Remember, for every 10 meters underwater you go, the pressure increases by a full atmosphere. Voyager is 343 meters long, so if it took a dive into the ocean and got fully submerged, the lowest end would experience almost 35 atmospheres of pressure. What about that scene in Into Darkness where the Enterprise was hiding underwater? That was stupid for many reasons, including transporters existing, shuttles existing, the prime directive issues with both diving and resurfacing, and also the physics. Yeah, I don't like to think too hard about Into Darkness. Same. Anyways, it's very doubtful that Voyager would be capable of going for a swim, much less exploring fluidic space. But that's just 21st century common sense, which is no match for 24th century technology and potential Federation OSHA regulations. Is there any canonical evidence for Voyager's Hall even having limitations? We do get canonical evidence in the Season 5 episode, Extreme Risk. The plot actually hinges on Voyager being unable to enter a gas giant to retrieve a probe 10,000 kilometers below the surface in a layer of liquid hydrogen and methane. Hydrogen's critical pressure is 13.3 atmospheres, which means that for it to technically be a liquid rather than a superliminal fluid, the pressure in that layer has to be less than 13.3 atmospheres. But superliminal fluids are often called liquids anyway due to their properties, just like on Jupiter where the superdense hydrogen fluid layers are referred to as molecular liquid hydrogen and metallic liquid hydrogen and pressure can be thousands of atmospheres. So this was a huge dead end. All this to say, Voyager can't even get close to 10,000 kilometers down into a gas giant without being crushed. So, canonically, the limit is less than 10,000 kilometers into a gaseous fluid bound by our universe's gravity. So, even if the special effects department got it wrong and fluidic space was actually gaseous, Voyager is very crushed if this universe follows our laws of physics. Probably. Unless. YouTuber Certifiably In Game actually presented two possible theories. One, is that the Borg and Voyager were visiting fluidic space early in the universe's existence, when the inward collapse was still in its very early stages and the pressure hadn't reached ship crushing yet. But since there was time for an apex species and an entire warp capable society to develop, and the early universe didn't really have great conditions for anything stable, I don't think this one is super likely. The second theory, which I like better, is that the organic matter which makes up fluidic space 
is the very thing preventing the universe from collapsing. Maybe it has a special property, like its own magnetic repulsion, which counteracts gravity and allows the density to remain constant. Kind of like dark energy in our universe, which causes the universe to expand despite all the matter that should pull it together. So if this property exists, maybe the universe isn't super dense and Voyager can survive fluidic space. So Voyager is probably crushed, but not definitely. And given the interdimensional differences in the complexity of the fluid, a bonus anti-crush property could exist? Exactly. Okay, sure. At this point, I think you're reaching. Always. Voyager's trip to fluidic space is ruled not impossible. By sheer force of a physicist's will. But this begs an even more important question. How in space would species 8472 survive coming to our dimension? Why would a lack of pressure be a problem for them? Isn't less pressure better on the hull? Their ships, built to withstand the external pressure of fluidic space, could definitely handle the almost nothing of our space, but the 8472 ships are organic. And they're used to swimming through a fluid, not flying through space. The ships and crew are multicellular organisms, used to living and breathing in a fluid. If you don't know what happens to multicellular organisms in the vacuum of space, may I recommend our recent video, 29 Ways to Die in Space? Spoiler, it's death. Freeze, bloat, blood boils. Humans get around a minute and 15 seconds to live at most. I don't care if you and your ship are the apex of biological evolution, whatever that means. Side note, evolution has no apex, no direction, no higher level. Evolution is just a chaotic process of a species slowly adapting to better fit their environments. Random changes to individuals' DNA happen due to radiation damage or copying errors, and usually those changes are either fatal or harmful in some other way. Sometimes those changes don't affect the individual's life, and on extremely rare occasions, those changes are beneficial, allowing the individual to produce more offspring. If the adaptation continues to benefit their offspring, the adaptation will keep propagating and potentially spread to the whole species. Now, the benefit or detriment of these adaptations is environment specific. Being bigger or taller might be beneficial if it means you can reach food on higher up tree branches, but detrimental if it means you can't hide as effectively from predators, or if food is scarce and now your caloric needs are higher. Because evolution is so specific to each species' home environment, and environments are constantly changing, there is no apex of evolution. That idea is wrong and emblematic of the Voyager writer's misunderstanding of evolution as a concept, but I promised I wouldn't talk about Threshold. Please, no. Can we get back to 8472? <sighs> right. They wouldn't last more than a couple minutes on organic ships built for fluidic space. These ships wouldn't necessarily even need sealed hulls. Humans happily drive with the windows down, so why would the A472 ships need to be airtight? And let's talk about propulsion. These organic ships would likely be moving like fish, dolphins, birds, or jellyfish, since there is a medium. Why waste resources on a propellant when motion will do the trick? Jellyfish, fish, birds, and dolphins form of propulsion relies on displacing matter. So if the 8472 ships relied on any of these for acceleration, they're dead in the lack of water. What if they just use warp for even sublight propulsion? It might make sense, since otherwise they need to use a lot more energy to overcome friction. Since, unlike in the vacuum of space, the second they stop propelling, they'd slow to a stop. If they use the warping of space even at sublight speeds, they're probably fine since that doesn't rely on matter displacement. But none of that propulsion tangent matters if they and their organic ships can't survive the vacuum of space. 
What if they used force fields, like Voyager's shields, which can deflect asteroids and weapons? Okay, say they use their shields, but that would put a ton of extra pressure on shields designed for use solely in combat. And given that 8472 is the only species in the entire dimension of fluidic space, and clearly are very organized against the Borg, why are they outfitted with such strong defenses and weapons? Who are they fighting? So unless they over-engineered their ships to withstand conditions which don't exist in their universe, on the off chance that the Borg would happen to open a quantum singularity and start an interdimensional war? No. There's zero chance they survive. But some life can survive the vacuum of space. What about the tardigrades? <sighs> the freaking tardigrades. I'm going to resist making a Star Trek Discovery joke here because I think that show gets a lot more hate than it deserves and I refuse to pile on. Terrible science and campy contrived plots is what Star Trek is all about, as evidenced by whatever we're talking about in this video. Right, Species 8472 and their ships might survive tardigrade style. Survive, while technically correct, is a strong term for what tardigrades do in space. They dehydrate, or shrivel up into tiny tardigrade raisins, and can be later rehydrated and resume living. Sometimes. Most tardigrades will die if left dehydrated for too long. So, if species 8472 could pull the tardigrade maneuver, despite being a way more complex organism and not having the right body shape for that to work, and having evolved in a universe completely devoid of voids, they'd enter our dimension, immediately shrivel up into raisins, hopefully survive the process, hopefully not be crushed or torn by their raisining ship, and hopefully be rehydrated and slowly brought back to life inside a Borg cube, surrounded by drones. Assuming the Borg find the Raisin ship and deem it relevant and worthy of assimilation. Which... just... no. No. 8472 shrivels up into a dehydrated, freeze-dried glob and has to be rehydrated before attacking the Borg. Such fearsome. Much threat. Wow. Did you just use Raisin as a verb? Even if A472 somehow survives raisining in the vacuum of space, it's not going to be a threat. So the entire premise of the episode is flawed. From a physics perspective, Voyager would most likely be crushed upon entry to fluidic space, and species A472 would definitely die immediately upon exposure to the vacuum of space. So, Scorpion bad? Of course not! It's one of my favorites, too. If I only watched sci-fi shows where the science was halfway decent, I would watch exactly one show. If you turn this into an advertisement for The Expanse... Season 6 is coming out soon, okay? I'm allowed to be excited! Anyways, I love Voyager. Flawed physics, misunderstanding evolution, and all. Voyager encouraged my love of science and taught me to investigate the very questions we're discussing in these videos. So by roasting the bad science in this episode, we're honoring the spirit of our favorite show, interacting as Long Life fans, and keeping it relevant 24 years later? Sure, why not? That makes this concept sound way less petty. Thank you all so much for watching this episode of Bad Astra, and thank you to Strings for joining me today. The other half of this collaboration, where we deep dive into the modified nanoprobes, is on his channel, so go check it out at the link in the description. Strings makes some fun biology videos, and is just getting started on YouTube, so if you're into squishy physics, why not subscribe to him as well? If you were sent here from his video, or are just new here, welcome to Bad Astra. Feel free to check out our other videos, and we'd really appreciate it if you subscribed or checked out our Patreon. Thank you so much. Remember, science is a process. And Tuvix deserved to die, Janeway did nothing wrong. Astra out. Astra, Astra. Astra.
To the stars. To the stars.